a little more. I will rest quickly through. So there have been many changes. Landfills have been taking place uh, at Majnuka Tila before our eyes. All the ring road side has been filled up. And most importantly, there was a large patch of Tameric forest immediate downstream of Wazirabad, which is even shown in the 1970 topo sheet, and it doesn't exist anymore there. That forest is completely gone. <coughs> now this is the Ganga Basin. This is the Yamuna Basin. I will skip quickly to show how it is and where we have been. I started then investigating right up to the source. So we made a little survey up to as far as we could go. On the left is the Yamuna from its source, Yamunotri and the two tributaries and towns right up to <coughs> Delhi. And so on the right you see the entire basin, the Yamuna and the towns. And I got interested more into towns for another reason. The flows, if you know, this is interesting feature of the river Yamuna that at its uh, confluence with the river Tons, it carries less water than the river Tons. And at Tajewala, it still has about only twice the amount than carried by Tons itself after the Giri and Asan meets it. And even downstream, the Yamuna carries more water than Ganga. And out of this, the Chambal carries a lot. Chambal carries more water at its confluence with Yamuna. And Yamuna carries more water because of that at Ganga. And even Kain and Betwa have more discharge than or roughly the same as <coughs> Yamuna at Tajewala. These are uh, the figures uh, taken from Dr. K. L. Rao's publication. The inflows and abstractions, you can see the arrows, uh, the, how much is the abstraction and how much is uh, <coughs> the water coming in right from Yamnotri onwards. And the water abstraction had started way back in 14th century itself when Feroz Shah Tughlaq created the first canals somewhere in the same area in, in Yamuna Nagar or near Tajewala. These canals have been replenished and renovated uh, at least twice or more times before Tajewala Barrage was constructed by the British in 1830s. In 1924, there was a very heavy flood which uh, threatened the Tajewala barrage and then the British redesigned the entire uh, <coughs> system once again. And most of the barrages have come after 1947 only. Now let us quickly go through the Yamuna as it looks from Yamnotri a little downwards and this is the river Yamuna at Kuthnur, on the left you can see the berm on the road and the Yamuna and they are the narrowest point up there it is no more than four feet and back you can't see the perhaps uh, a little uh, bridge through which the, um, you have to cross but that portion had got flooded because the water was unable to move down because of the landslide largely on the right side. This is the situation along Yamuna and this is right at the upper left one is at Kuthnur where the landslide had obstructed river Yamuna. Now we went into Tons and the diagram on the right is the Tons uh, uppermost watershed. We have several glaciers there. This is Jamdar glacier on the left. My students did uh, track up to 3759 meters at uh, Ruinsara and this is tracking. We did establish the first time a digital rain gauge there to record the rains 
This is the situation at Ruinsara Lake on there and the glacier, the amount of grazing in Harki Dun. This is Obragat and Supingat, other two tributaries on the left. And you can see the steep fall and the very rapids that occur in that area. But the catchment is so degraded. That's the state of degradation in the Tons Basin. And this is again some stream. As we are moving just downwards uh, <coughs> from Tons Basin, the lower right, here you see a river with bluish color lower right as river Rupin, which comes from Himachal. Absolutely clear, transparent water, while Supin, which comes from Harkidun and the other side, is all muddy. You can't have a transparency of even 10 centimeters. That was so muddy. And the confluence is at Netwar, where it gets its name as real tones. This watershed we have investigated in detail, the water qualities, uh, the um, vegetation, and uh, this is very different. In fact, the Tons Basin is the confluence between the western part and the eastern part of Himalaya, you know, the biogeographic zones, and the vegetation meets here, and you find some very special peculiarities in the Tons zone, which had never been investigated before. Though Pollan in, in his book on Himalayan flowers says that this is likely to be the confluence point, but he never uh, surveyed this area. This is the rainfall to show only how variable it is with the altitudes. The upper one is at Osla and Harkidun, where the rainfall, this big figure, 17 mm was the maximum water rainfall and one day. At Harkidun, this was 25 millimeters, is still maximum on one day, but little more rain, more widespread. And at Netwar, the maximum rain was 95 millimeters on one day, rather on two different days, but there was much more rain. So as we come down, the rain is more. The upper meadows are having very little. Now see, just as the stones comes down near Purola, we start... Uh, channelizing it. This embankment has been made, used as a road, but because the fields and the settlement are right there. Even in the mountains, if the river comes down to a small valley, you have it. And this river is still used for transporting logs. Come down to Ichari, this reservoir has been made, and the effect of this reservoir downstream is this. This is immediate downstream, perhaps only a distance that the camera can capture. The river further down through a little rocky area. And this is somewhere uh, down Mori in, in between this uh, dark pathar. Now river Yamuna again, because uh, when Tons meets uh, Yamuna, at uh, Dark Pathar, then the real Yamuna starts. Uh, <coughs> and uh, after that uh, Dark Pathar, as the river Yamuna moves down, there is Asan, which is meeting it from the left bank. And this is the condition, because there is a barrage at Dark Pathar, all the water is diverted for hydropower, and even at Asan, there is a barrage, now Asan Barrage, a conservation area and so on, and all the gravel mining is going on. The river at Pounta Saib. This is the river before Pounta Saib, and this is the river at Pounta itself, you can see the temple there. Now, we come down to Kalesar. It is a national park, a forested area, and in the winter, the river downstream of Tajewala, it is right downstream of the barrage, but of course, the day the photograph was taken, the Hathni Kund had become operational, so there was no water being released from Hathni Kund towards Tajewala also. This is the Western Yamna Canal, but there is a diversion little from the Yamna Canal also, where fish ranching takes place. 
and uh, within the canal they are trying to do this. More interesting thing is that from this canal there are several hydroelectric projects which have been made there, even on the canal water, using a little gradient that is available there. So they don't leave even the canals for hydropower water of the river. The important thing which uh, perhaps uh, <coughs> Manu Mishraji will be talking about, what is the highest flood levels? These are the records on the Tajewala Barrage printed forever. The highest flood was in 1924 at uh, 1077 feet elevation and that's of course given in meters and then the flood came of the same level almost in August 78. More than 50 years later again the flood came. After that none of the floods have reached that level this is the Hatni Kun Baraj data uh, they have given, I just went there. I fail to understand why first they considered the 100 year frequency flood and 500 year frequency flood when they don't want to consider the flood plain as an area where the flood goes. This itself shows that the engineers are aware of or concerned about the flood discharges of 100 year and 500 year frequency and they tried to design it but the spillway was only at 331 meters crest level while the highest flood level would have been at uh, 342 meters in case of 500 year flood. So they know that the flood could be but we had more than 7 lakh Qsecs already while the maximum in 100 years could be 776 according to their own calculations. These are the peak discharges there. You can see that between 78 and uh, somewhere uh, 88 the peak floods were very low but after that we have at least three or four peak floods and the one last year was again a peak which would be shown there. So the frequency of these peak floods has increased, not decreased because of the activities upstream. Look at river Yamuna between Panipat and Sonipat. We don't need a transport, we don't need a bridge because people can go, we don't need boats. And if it is, even the rickshaw is being pushed through the river. The entire river bed, I am not talking of the flood plain, this is the river bed which is cultivated with cucurbits. And this is again the river bed and part of the flood plain from where the irrigation is also taking place. Whether you make a pit or just put a pump, and the sand mining right into the middle of the river. These pictures would be of interest because they were all taken in 1986-87. This was the condition on the left of the slums between old Yamna bridge and ITO. This Dhobi Ghat was at Nizamuddin. This is the <coughs> dumping of wastes and these buffaloes are also at Nizamuddin. The pollution of course this is very well known how much garbage is now coming in and we investigated the land use changes all along uh, Yamuna based on the topo sheet of 1970 and the remote sensing imageries in 2001 and we find the large number of changes there in the river morphology, in the settlements increasing several fold, the grasses and vegetation going down and uh, this is the meandering also but I would draw your attention to this one. This left uh, stream, Big Tar, this is known as Choti Yamuna. It is uh, a little over uh, above uh, Panipat, 
this doesn't exist any more there. When we started and uh, took the topo sheet, we thought that yes, the river is there and we were trying to trace it on the remote sensing image. We never could find. The student made a mistake, you know, some diagram, some dry river bed and he said, oh, here it is perhaps. But then when we made a survey right in the field, we found that red line is the embankment which had already been created. And Choti Yamna had been completely cut off except that there was an underpass uh, through which the, if excess water comes, can still enter. But the river bed was completely dry and was under cultivation. So this big change has taken place, even a whole stream has been removed. You can see this uh, meandering of the river. Uh, the two colors show between two different years. Uh, <coughs> the lighter ones are 1970 and the darker one is 2002. And this is all along as we go towards Delhi from this. Everywhere it has been changing. This all through the change has taken place. Uh, this on the left is near Sonipat. And here uh, the embankment was created quite towards the west, but the river does not flow anymore. Earlier the river was perhaps flowing there, but now this whole land has been under cultivation and this has become more like a terrace. Some villages are there. These embankments and the shifting the river. Here again the same thing, the river has shifted. Earlier in 1970 there was a big loop and the embankments were made accordingly. Now the river has straightened. We have published also part of this. This is the pollution data which is used for the Yamna action plan. So the waste water treatment has to be there, all STPs have to be created in different cities and so on, that is very important, but the planners are ignoring the consequence of their own actions and a new plan which is this. A large number of all red dots are the planned hydropower projects, the dams will be created right up to the glaciers. That is why I have shown you some of those pictures from where we have studied and the, this dot all go right in this area. Jakhol, Taluka, Netwar, Rupin, for uh, one below they have already been at Mori Hangol, a public hearing has already been done. So if these all dams come up besides the existing ones or under construction, we can see there will be hardly any water anywhere, all the rivers, the whole upper watershed will be gone, degradation is there and we don't know whether the river will be at all surviving anymore. I was asked that at least I can talk about what needs to be done to revive the river. If we know that why the river is dying and how the river gradually dies, we need to only look at again the same five points. We need to restore the habitats. We need to restore the flow regimes, restore the flood plains, prevent pollution and restore the catchments. And I think this is the sequence in which we have to go. But habitats and flow regimes will go together then the, when the flow is there, then only the flood plain will be there. If there is no flow, no regime is maintained, then the flood plains cannot be revived. And if the flood plains are there and the flow regimes are maintained and the habitats are revived, I think we will not have to invest in STPs as much as we do today. So that will itself be the prevention of pollution and control of pollution. We have to treat the wastes within the city before they go and the rest will be taken care of by the rivers, flows and the wetlands, that is the floodplain. And that is what I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Indeed. And we have uh, very steady. I thought we'd have tea. Tea can be brought in here or should we?
the note here says, uh, I have asked them to serve it in.